what we have, this is 2008 data, is basically, you know, sort of 15 years after 94, massive public investment, an economy that is not providing any new jobs, you have a very profound perpetuation of racial inequality that persists in the city. Just the other sort of aspect to really get a feel for the built fabric that sort of, uh, as a manifestation of this is, is you know, is so we do sort of comply with the, the cliche of two cities. Um, so there's the city of the wealthy and the modern sort of uh, globally connected kind of fabric, um, which is supported by a kind of American style suburbanization. Um, so this is a very typical white uh, middle class neighborhood. So you can see every house has a pool and a fairly large plot and so on. Um, and then, of course, sort of the working class areas and poor areas of the city. So this is a very typical sort of representation of the fabric of informal settlements. And this is the public housing that was built in the 50s and 60s that, of course, has now been degraded and completely uh, webbed through with also informal structures, as you can see there. But in both of these instances, you have an expression of this completely monofunctional uh, modernist norm. Um, so whether you talk about new public housing that's been built since 94 or the leafy suburbs, it's exactly the same uh, spatial form and structure. So in 1994, you know, we, uh, just to say that, you know, it's important to remind ourselves that three, four months before the elections happened in May 1994, none of us who have been involved in the anti-apartheid struggle, building mass movements and so on, really allowed ourselves to believe that the elections would happen, okay? So the period between 91 and 94 was the bloodiest in our history. So about 18,000 people were killed in political violence in that period, and that is, um, um, that's about 10 times more than the number that was killed between 1960 and 1990. On the ground, there were a whole series of negotiations that had started in 86, 87, between resistance movements, what we call civic movements in South Africa, and former white local authorities. And so when 1994 happened, there had in fact been three years of negotiations around a new public housing policy and around the reform of the local government system. The imaginary at the time was there were sort of four things that had to happen simultaneously to transform uh, the urban landscape. D democratic decentralization, so very strong push for a participatory democratic planning system through local government reform, but linked to a very strong agenda for fiscal decentralization. So local authorities in South Africa's response for up to 80% of their own revenue. In the metros, it goes up to 90%. So you can imagine it gives them a lot of room to sort of do strategic things, if you will. All of those households had a right to free housing and land as a kind of entitlement. And the entire urban program in South Africa has been constructed to achieve that particular ambition. Of course, with the housing was also an agenda to provide free access to basic services. So even if you didn't, couldn't afford to pay for services, that a certain minimum was at least an entitlement. Okay, so we've been spectacularly successful in executing this public housing program. And of course, the development sort of assumption was that if you give people a house, following very much the kind of de Soto rationale, you are transferring an asset, and this would be the sort of leg up for economic empowerment, right? And, um, and, and the approach that they took was the full subsidy route, okay, so for the entire thing, um, and they set a target. And we said we're gonna deliver a million houses. Um, this would have been then, at that point, in terms of the calculation, um, almost 45% of the total need, okay, would be delivered within the first five years. And, you know, as I say, uh, up until today, 2.3 million subsidies have been awarded and about 1.6 million houses have actually been built. Basically, the market only deals for 10% of households. Uh, there's sort of an emerging affordable gap housing market, but the, there hasn't really been uptake. And this is what the public subsidy is meant to provide for. And if you further segment the income groups, you can see that the large bulk of it is below the 1,500 mark. And so in that particular financial year, 271,000 subsidies or houses were delivered. Okay, so if you spread that nationally between the provinces and so on, this is a pretty impressive machine, okay, to be able to churn that out. This is what the picture looks like in Cape Town. Um, the backlog at the moment is pegged at 400,000 households that need, and that's a combination of backyard shacks and people who live in informal areas. In terms of the value of the subsidy and how much can be built in terms of one house, uh, they can deliver at optimal capacity 16,000 units per annum. The demand is growing at 16,000 units per annum. Now, there's been a policy reform in 1994, and there was an understanding that you don't necessarily have to provide the full thing. So at the moment, in terms of the dominant debates within the ruling party, 
um, this is still very much the political preference, which is couched in a kind of discourse that if you begin to consider other ways of responding to this need, you are basically saying that black people are not allowed to have a house. So the one thing that has been hugely successful is the provision of basic services. I don't have data here, but I can show you numbers. Uh, in, if I take the Cape Town example again, where we've got 25% of the population living in informal areas, um, uh, on all the key basic services, all the metrics, sanitation, waste removal once a month, access to energy and so on, it's all above 90%. Okay? So the one thing that local authorities know how to do is provide engineering services in South Africa and roll it out. Okay? So you say to them, get it to the townships, get it into the informal areas, that they can do. Um, the problem, of course, is that because of the housing policy and how that works, these houses are in the wrong place economically. Okay? So you uh, you sort of endow people with a supposed asset, you give them free services, but they can't make a living because they can't socially and economically reproduce themselves because they're completely marginalized in the urban system. This is the crux of the urban challenge at the moment, and, and generally we're still struggling away into the debate. Okay? But the first issue is that we've clearly, as I've shown you across these various responses, we've got a very aggressive and, uh, and a, a significant public sector response from a fiscal point of view. But what we've had is that we've, we've been unable to achieve the kind of cumulative impact between these different investments. The other sort of outlier that has emerged, which is very, very interesting, is a new discourse around city regionalism. So in Gauteng and in the Cape Town city region, there's been a very deliberate process to go beyond the metropolitan boundaries. Now remember, we've got metropolitan government, which is a, one of the really big achievements in the last 20 years. But, of course, all of the key long-range, long-term strategic planning questions has to take a city region sort of ambit with its environmental catchment issues or transport planning and so on. And there's a kind of ascendancy, particularly in Johannesburg and Gauteng, to really come to terms with this. And this could really radically reconfigure a lot of the urban debates. And at the moment, the OECD is completing a review of the city region, which is a kind of first step to begin to open up this political space. So we'll see where that goes. But more perniciously, that this is reinforcing, obviously, the divided, unequal, and unsustainable urban forms that apartheid produced. And so, in a way, where we are today is that we're still struggling with a kind of a language about, you know, sort of what is the, the, the right institutional recalibration that we need, to, and, and what could be a, a political paradigm for the urban that, is re that has resonance, right? Because if you can't get resonance within uh, the ruling party, you know, we're obviously never going to make any progress. Um, and, and we still don't know what that is to begin a sort of a serious process of thinking and a serious practice uh, on what I would call uh, the urban.